hunts uh, Sistanki as a parasite alongside the shelter forests, and then they harvest it and use it for herbal medicine. Next slide. But we examined Sistanki and found that it is very um, confused. So on the right there is a, a phylogenetic tree. And we find that Sistanki tubulosa appears in three separate clades. What that means is, if we have any phylogeneticists in the audience, is that it is not monophyletic. So it has been artificially treated as one thing but there are probably different things. And so what botanists do in this situation is we look at the type specimen. But the type specimen of Sistanki tubulosa is missing. And what do botanists do when the type specimen is missing? We have to assign a new one. So this is, ooh, is our neotype of Sistanki tubulosa, which is in Sinai in the Middle East. Um, and that is now the neotype. And what that means is that when we do experiments in the future, we have one version of the truth to return to. Next slide. And this is um, another one that is confused. On the left there, can you see it has long bracts on the stem, the, the long filiform bracts? And on the right there, it has bracts close to the stem. Um, so just like AD, Adrian, was looking at the, the different features carefully of the Rafflesia flowers. So Majed, my former student, was looking very carefully at the features of Sistanki. And again, we found them to be different. And we have, we have, done, uh, we have made what's called a phylogeny, the genetic relatedness of these plants. But it takes a long, long time <laughs> to do. So we, it's still not published. Next slide. Now I'll say something about these plants, the pitcher plants. I love these plants. When I was a little boy, I dreamt about coming to uh, Borneo, Malaysia, and Sumatra, and these wonderful places that I could only see in books because I wanted to see these plants. Because do you know what? You have the most special plants in the world, and you are the envy of, of the world for your wonderful flora. And so these pitcher plants always fascinated me. And these are my, my paintings of them. Next slide. This is the king pitcher plant, Nepenthes raja. And these pitchers are very, very big, the size of buckets. Huge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's get this. Next slide. And so together with my mathematics, um, my colleagues in mathematics, we wanted to examine the surface of the peristome. So you know if, if, um, if this is your pitcher plant, the, the rim at the top, this is called the peristome. This is the bit that the, the insects slide off and then they fall down into the trap where the plant consumes the, the insect. But we wanted to examine why are they different shapes sizes and properties. And so we looked at lots of different uh, patterns of Nepenthes peristome. And we found that different shapes and sizes, we predict using mathematics that insects will behave differently. So we looked at, do we have any physicists? Anyone who does physics? Physics? No, no, no physicists here. So we looked at um, Newtonian mechanics Newtonian mechanics and how they fall from the surface. And we found that they behave very differently. So you remember from my picture, there are lots of different shapes and sizes of Nepenthes. That is because they probably are trapping different types of insects in their different environment. The other thing we found is a mystery. So can you see these, these teeth that they have? So we showed mathematically that these teeth have a high cost of production energetically. So for a plant to produce these, it must cost the plants a lot. And what this means to an evolutionary biologist is, it is probably under positive selection. In, that, in other words, it serves a purpose. You would not make them if they were not doing something. 
So they must be doing something, but we don't know what it is. So this is, sometimes there are more questions than answers in science. And this work has generated another question about Nepenthes. Very interesting. Here they are again. Um, this is, these graphs explain what I've just shown, that there is a, so basically in this graph, we see that this, for this, the, the uh, versus the expressed as a trade-off, the benefit decreases the bigger the teeth. The bigger the teeth, the higher the cost, the, and therefore it must be doing something to produce these teeth. But we don't know what that is. Maybe we need to go and look at these plants in nature and understand that. Next slide. Um, and, and we also found that different sizes of peristome have an impact on the prey that, that is, is caught. And this we published in, in PNAS. Uh, so now um, the last part of my research is biomimetics. I think this is a video. Oh, maybe not. Um, this, this is a funny plant. You may not have seen this. It does not grow here. This is the squirting cucumber. Its, its fruits explode. So we grow this in the Botanic Garden. It's from the Mediterranean. And the, the it's, you cannot eat it, but it's a kind of cucumber. And the stem grows up, and it reaches a certain time, and then bang, it explodes. And it sends its seeds all over the place. And we are trying to understand why does it do that. Next slide. And so we've been examining, using CT scanning, the internal structure of the fruits. And then we've been examining what happens when it ejects its seeds. So the, the, the fruit explodes. It's very violent, actually. It, and sometimes if you touch it, it can all explode in your face. And you get seeds all, all over. Um, and we wanted to understand how this mechanism works and why it evolved to explode. It sends its seeds out in a long, linear stream of liquid, like a transect. And what we suggest is that this plant is sending its seeds at a suitable distance away from the, the parent plant to avoid competition with the parent plant. So sometimes with trees in forests, we see that they disperse their seeds in a way that reduces what we call intraspecific competition. And we think that the same is happening with the cucumber. It's not a long-term dispersal mechanism. It's a short-term dispersal mechanism. So the seeds get a suitable distance, up to about nine meters, um, away from the parent plant to reduce competition. So it's a, a population dynamic stabilizer, if you will. And we think that's why this cucumber has evolved to explode. And so we're doing lots of modeling, using statistical modeling, to look at if you make assumptions or rules about how many seeds are successful and over what gradient, you can then model future generations of exploding cucumbers. Isn't it fun to, as a botanist to be able to work on exploding cucumbers? <laughs> Next slide. This is another project that we have not yet started. Um, we need to find a PhD student to, to work with us on this. Now, people have melanosomes in their skin. Um, so that means that they respond to sunlight to, to produce melanin to, to go to your skin goes darker. Um, in the UK, we have very little sun, so my skin never goes darker. <laughs> um, but in the sun, my skin will go darker. Um, and, and so... Um, that, that is a, um, a, a feature of human biology. Um, meanwhile, plants um, have chloroplasts. Um, but So we have m melanosomes. Uh, plants have chloroplasts. But this is a special kind of sea slug, a nudibranch, that exists in the seawater ar around the UK and in Europe. And it has a very strange biology because it, it consumes algae, and then the chloroplasts from the algae, they migrate, like a melanosome migrates in our skin, it migrates to the skin of sea slug, and they carry on being functional there. So in m most of the time, if you eat something, the chloroplasts 
are digested, they disappear. But in this case, the chloroplasts are able to live autonomously in the sea slug. And that is very strange biologically. How can a chloroplast exist outside of a plant and live for many months in the si inside the sea slug? We do not know. It's very, very strange. And so my colleague here, is, who is a cancer biologist, would like for us to understand better how these chloroplasts can live and function in the sea slug because he thinks it might help us to understand more generally in biology how melanosomes travel in our skin and, and link this to the study of skin cancer. Um, so it's a very indirect form of research linked to skin cancer. But we have not started this work yet, so we have no results and we have no sea slugs. We need to send our students to the, to the sea to collect our sea slugs so we can study them. Next slide. Um, how am I doing for time? Half 11. What time did I start? 10 minutes more. I'll keep it short. Okay. So this, this bit will be short. I want to show you some lovely flora from around the world. Next slide. This is in Japan. This is, um, they call it the Japanese Alps. This is um, Mount Tateyama. And we went to the top. Next slide. And these are the wonderful things we saw in Japan. There is an, an arisema. It's like your amorphophallus, only it's much, much smaller. And then in the middle was a rock ptarmigan. And look at its beautiful camouflage. And it changes with the seasons. In winter, it's pure white. And in summer, when we went, it's mottled brown and white. So it camouflage changes. Um, and these are my friends, Godo-san and um, Ohara-san. Who, who shared their flora with me. Next slide. This is a very different flora, one that, that you may not have seen. Um, so my best taxonomic skills, I'm not such a good tropical taxonomic botanist, my best taxonomy is in the Mediterranean and Macronesia, where I've spent lots of time in the field. And this is, these are in the Canary Islands in Macronesia. So off the coast of North Africa in the Atlantic, is a collection of islands with very strange plants, very strange. This one is called an Echium, Echium wildpretii, and it's about as tall as the top of this screen, very, very big. Um, and it produces this flowering stem after two years, and then the plant dies. Um, and you can walk among forests of these very strange flowers. This one is a Drachina, and you have Drachina growing in your grounds of Benkulu, but this is a very rare one that grows only on a few cliffs in the Canary Islands, and I had to climb up a cliff, because you remember I said I like heights. I had to climb up a cliff to reach it. This is a strange plant that looks like it belongs in the sea, Serapegia, and then this one is not a cactus, not a cactus. No, this is a euphorbia, believe it or not. So the euphorbias in the desert look like this. So like the uh, cacti in the Americas, the euphorbias in Africa and Macronesia evolved to look like a cactus to cope with environmental pressures around drought. C4. Yes, Cam. Yes, correct. Yes, Cam. Yeah. Here are some more. This is um, Apteranthes is the, is the new name. It's changed name a little succulent. This is a Canary Island bellflower. It grows only in the intact forests of the Canary Islands. And this is uh, one of the um, forgotten, Aeonium. Aeoniums. Next slide. And we do conservation work in the Canary Islands. So this is an ecologist called Matias, and this is me. And we plant local flora in the city. So here is the flora in, in the city. This is in a very poor um, city called Arecife. So the people there are, are quite poor, and they do not have access to nature and green space. So we wanted to bring nature into the city. And remember that this island is very, very dry. So plants do not grow easily like here. There is no, almost no rain. In some years, almost no rain at all. Um, so it's very difficult to grow things. But this, this photo was taken a couple of weeks ago that our plants have survived, which is, which is very good. And we are doing a, a conservation experiment on this rare parasite called Cinnamorium. 
which we are which we are trying to reintroduce because it it's is almost extinct on the islands next slide this is one of the strangest plants in the world so rafflesia is very strange this is the strangest plant in africa it is called hidnora and it grows in in the semi deserts it's a parasite of euphorbia next slide and my phd student seb on the right is examining hidnora and on the next slide he recently wrote a monograph with us and and described this as a uh, he described a new species and this is very exciting on the next slide oh no actually not this is prosopanchi this is its sister lineage in south america it looks like a fungus but it's a plant next slide yeah here so we are trying to grow it like like we are trying to propagate rafflesia um, because Hidnora has only been grown once before, so we wanted to see if we could propagate it. So we've done some more grafting experiments <laughs> to try and graft it onto its host. I do not know if it's successful yet. And I've nearly finished. No, I haven't. <laughs> this is, um, I just wanted to say a, a, a thing or two about traditional herbal medicine, because Plants and biodiversity are important, but so is our traditional medicine of how plants are used. So in Indonesia, there is a very, very rich um, history of use of plants by indigenous communities. People's lives and plants are very closely intertwined. And the same is true in Iraq. And I worked with my colleagues to publish a herbal of Iraq looking at traditional Islamic herbal medicine, how these plants have, have been used for thousands of years by people. And so we published this herbal with Q, examining some of the uses of, of these plants. And we, we looked at lots of specimens in the herbarium in Q to do this. Um, and just a quick note that sometimes you find plants in unexpected places. This is a very rare species called Orobanchi. And you can see from my map, it only grows in a few places. One of them is in the, the Isle of Wight, which is on the very south coast of the UK. It has nice white cliffs and blue sea. And on the cliffs, you find this rare plant. But on the next slide, we unexpectedly found it in a big industrial estate in South Wales. And no one knew it was there. And it had been there for a long time. So sometimes plants appear in unexpected places. So this was um, a conservation success story for us. And we are now growing some of these rare plants in the Botanic Garden um, for conservation. And the last, I'm nearly finished, but the last part of my talk is about sharing our story. So I said, that in a changing world, we, we seek to understand plants. We work together as a global community. And we share our story with the world. And that's very important because people tend to be more interested in animals than they are plants. But plants are fundamental to all of our existence. We could not exist without plants. They're so important. And so some of our work that we've done, we've shared with international audiences around the world. I was saying earlier that our work in the Philippines was in Rapla. And we've also been in other news channels. And this is very important because people must know about the importance of the, of the work we do. And the paper that we published with Professor Pak Argus and, and colleagues from around Southeast Asia, this one was, was in news channels all around the world, um, which is important because it shows people how special these plants are and how important it is that we look after them. Next. Um, and these are some photos. You will recognize these. Um, because one of the wonderful things about Benkulu and my colleagues from the Philippines and I were so very impressed by how much people care very deeply about Rafflesia here. And so we are in no doubt that Rafflesia will be well protected by the people of Benkulu because you are its custodians and you care very deeply for, for your Rafflesia and you understand how special it is. Um, and we were, we were very pleased to see that. And, and that this man here, Oh, sorry, back one. Back. This man here has Rafflesia on his clothes, as you do, sir. <laughs> and then my last slide is, um, I could not fit everyone on here who I wanted to thank. Um, so as many people who, who could fit who were featured in this tour today, 
Um, thank you so much, Trema Kasi, to all these people. This, what I was sharing today was not my work, it's a group effort. Um, and Trema Kasi to you all um, for being here to, to talk with me today. So thank you. And I'm very happy to answer questions, um, but I'm happy if you do not have them as well, but I know you've been bribed. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Crystal Goods. Interesting presentation. So, uh, as we planned before, in the last part of this uh, lecture, we have a question and answer session. Please, if uh, any question from audience, Yep, one from in the bags and yep. Can someone give the mic? Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Tani Nuriani. Uh, firstly, I am sorry. Uh, my English is was so bad. <laughs> it's good. It's good. Uh, okay. Uh, firstly, I'm so excited for today because the guest is from Oxford University, and I'm a fan of Harry Potter film, and the film is setting in uh, Oxford University, of course. The film. So I was so excited today. Uh, but uh, the main reason why I'm excited because the uh, agenda. So because uh, I'm a forestry student, so I need this uh, agenda. So back to the topic. My question is: In the midst of a current work change, how can we continue to preserve plants, especially endemic plants, to continue? to survive amidst the threat of extinction, what shall we improve or do? I think I answer, so you, you're a forestry student and you said, um, how can we continue to conserve plants that are I isolated, you were saying, so sort of from habitat destruction or? From climate change, climate change, sorry, yes. yes. Yes, thank you. Um, yes, I think um, it's a it's a big question. <laughs> it's a big question, and I do, and of course I don't have all the answers, um, but I c I can certainly share share my view. I think there are several things that are important. One is to is to understand um, and s to do work to understand about ecosystem resilience, such as the work that you do. Um, so we need um, so, so the the debate must be informed by science, so we must work scientifically to understand what is happening and what we can do about it. Um, I think another thing that's important, which I mentioned in the talk, is um, people's appreciation and awareness of plants. Of course, that cannot change what's happening in the climate, um, but it can change at a local level what we do to respond to it and how we manage um, ecosystems. And I think the, the third thing that perhaps we can do is not give up hope. <laughs> so, so sometimes the situation can feel quite hopeless, um, and, and I feel that too. So in my own country, we see the effects of climate change. So last summer, we had our first day where the, the temperature reached 40 degrees, so the same as it is in here <laughs> now. <laughs> it was very, very hot, and we'd never had that temperature before and the plants started to die. So we, we know, uh, you know, I understand and I've seen it firsthand. So, so I, I, it's a very difficult challenge. But at the same time, we must not give up hope. And um, a colleague of mine based in Oxford called Yadvinder Mali, he's an Indian scientist, and he works in Borneo with people in Sabah. And they found that um, they look at the resilience of secondary forests compared with primary forests, and they've got lots of data to show a greater level of resilience than we might have expected. So, so sometimes nature can be 
can be more resilient than, than we think. And I think another thing I'll say is that the, the science director of Kew Gardens in London, Alex Antonelli, he, he said that whilst there are still habitats intact, our focus must be to protect them. So, so we must not give up hope. So I think my, my, my very general answer to, to your specific question is, um, is to care deeply about what we, what we love and what we must conserve and not to lose hope in that as well. Thank you for your question. Thank you. And then the second one. Yep. Uh, baiklah, perkenalkan nama saya Hidayah Fauzia. Di sini saya ingin bertanya. Pada slide yang dijelaskan tadi, ada yang menjelaskan tentang bagian-bagian rafresia. Saya ingin bertanya, bagaimana upaya pelestarian dapat membantu memitigasi dampak perubahan lingkungan pada populasi bunga rafresia? Dan apakah bunga rafresia memiliki adaptasi khusus terhadap perubahan iklim dan i perubahan suhu dan iklim global? Terima kasih. It sounded long. <laughs> okay, uh, Fauzia. Uh, her name is Fauzia. He asked about uh, how we conserve the Raplesia. So there are a lot of, uh, you, you say, part of the Raplesia, I mean the life cycle. Yes. And then how uh, we can conserve against the climate change. Yes. Um, gosh, very, very interesting questions. Thank you. Very difficult questions as, as well. Um, is that better? Okay. Um, yes, I mean, the single best thing we can do is to, is to conserve the habitat of Raphlesia because of its very complicated and interconnected ecology. And we do not understand all of the ecology and the interactions. You know, we do not know to what extent fungal partners may be important. We, we, there's, there is more we don't know than we do. And because of that, it is better to conserve Rafflesia in its habitat rather than out of its habitat. Um, so habitat protection is the single most important thing. The next, most, the next important thing, I, I think, and I'll be interested to hear my colleagues' views as well, is for new generations, we have lots of young people here, for new generations, to care for Rafflesia, just as Yogi and others we, we saw in, in Kawor, Kawor um, care deeply for Rafflesia, and they are the custodians of Rafflesia, and they help protect it in its habitat. Because the reality is that forests can be places of conflict, because we need things from the forest. We need them for food, for productivity. But they're also places of biodiversity. And so sometimes where those places come into conflict, we need custodians to help share the importance of those forests. And Adrian in the Philippines is also doing this with his awareness campaign for Rafflesia. And that means that when people need to cut the forest to convert it, we can avoid the forests where Rafflesia is growing. But we will only do that if people know it's there. So, so awareness is very important. So I think the two things, habitat protection, ideally at an official level, and also um, awareness. But I may ask at this point if Professor Pak Argus would like to comment on this as, as well. Terima kasih. Saya buat saya Indonesia saja. Untuk Rafflesia, kalau kita lihat dengan perubahan iklim, sebetulnya belum ada penelitian bagaimana hubungan Rafflesia dengan iklim. Salah satu contoh ya, uh, site saya tahun 2000 itu di kebun penduduk kopi ya, sampai sekarang ada. Jadi panas itu sebetulnya. Kemudian di di tempat lain di Kepayang itu ada sekitar hutan sekunder luasnya kira-kira 100 meter persegi masih ada itu rafisianya 
uh, kelihatannya kalau kita lihat kelihatannya kalau Rusia akan survive kalau liannya lianannya tidak terganggu itu adalah fakta kemudian di di Padang dekat uh, ada satu Rusia yang di belakang rumah dan itu uh, apa pada dia berbunga terus artinya boleh jadi itu merupakan salah satu kemampuan dari Rusia dan inangnya untuk survive di sana sebetulnya persoalan banyak Rusia mati itu kadang-kadang di penghulu ya di kebun kemudian dia dipotong alasannya banyak macam ya alasannya contohnya kalau ada Rusia di sini apa keuntungan yang diberikan ke pemilik kebun banyak sekali tadi saya cerita eh, lokasi saya dua, dua rib, tahun 2000 lokasi saya tahun yang sama di Padang Guci tidak ada sekarang kalau ke sana tidak ada jadi masih masih apa uh, itu adalah peluang ya seperti Chris katakan jangan jangan berhenti berharap never stop is a very good hope to conserve the rarity jangan putus asa dengan hal-hal itu kalau di di Bengkulu yang paling bagus itu sebetulnya kerjasama antara penduduk lokal dengan 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 institusi seperti seperti unit maupun seperti hotspot banyak lokasi kalau kita lihat ada KPPL sebetulnya tadi disebutkan uh, sebutkan oleh uh, Chris KPPL itu ada sekarang itu kira-kira ada 11 kelompok KPPL itu bukan orang kehutanan bukan orang biologi kadang-kadang anggotanya itu adalah petani dan itu cukup cukup memberikan custodian dia bilang penjagaan terhadap pen, uh, lokasi itu kalau kamu tadi ada uh, yang bilang ada film ya sebetulnya custodian of galaxy lihat pernah lihat <laughs> guardian almost the same okay. <laughs> guardian of galaxy kayak begitu jadi intinya jangan berhenti uh, mempunyai harapan we talk about the Chris we talk about the, the how climate influencing to population uh, Laurisia and we have uh, real my my old site it was uh, uh, 20 uh, 2000 and like now we we can see the flowering Laurisia in that site but the other side is when we in the same time uh, my side the another side uh, at the, at the 2000 right now it's gone because of some people cut uh, cut the, the the secondary forest and also cut the the woody plant so i agree with you that uh, we we supposed to not to give up the hope that we can uh, uh, conserve Ralphasia forever like this. So uh, today, uh, I guess tomorrow, tomorrow we will go to Ralphasia in, in, in southern Bengkulu. I guess it's in, in the coffee plantation, I guess. Yes, yes. You also said that uh, most of Ralphasia is, is right now is in, in the outside of the forest. So basically, there is a hope that uh, we can conserve our vision outside the forest. And that's all that I can explain to, to our students. Okay. Terima kasih. Okay. Uh, other questions, maybe, from the biology? Please, Mr. Sipri. Oke, 
Okay, uh, good afternoon, Dr. Chris. Thank you so much uh, for your uh, presentations. I think it's really interesting. So I had some questions and oh, uh, introduce. Uh, we are from biology. I'm Dr. Rizky, and also this is uh, our uh, partner, uh, Dr. Cipriadi. Uh, because uh, now we are focusing uh, research in, especially in microbiology, uh, we are uh, learn and study about the microbial community in Rapalisia Arnoldi. Right, so yeah. I have some questions maybe related about that. Yes. Uh, maybe uh, we want to know about, uh, is there any researcher or maybe, uh, yeah, uh, the researcher uh, concerns about uh, to know the correlations between the interactions of the Rapalisia and also uh, the microbial community mm -hmm. in the Oxford or maybe in the England. Because uh, we know that the Rapalisia uh, cannot stand by themselves to, to grow up, I mean, mm -hmm. because uh, there are some of the internal or maybe external factors, especially from the microbial also. Yeah, yeah. So that's why we want to know about that. And then mm -hmm. uh, the second question, we know that the species of the Rapalisia in the world uh, especially in also in Bengkulu, we have five species and they have different colors. Yes. So uh, we want to know about why it can be happens. I mean, uh, the gradations or the variety of the colors in the Rapalisia, because uh, uh, we want to know is there any connections uh, with the, uh, I mean, the chemical compound inside and also the microbial inside because. We have already and successfully isolated the, mi the, the microbes, the bacteria, I mean. We got uh, the potential bacteria from Seratia. They produce the red pigment, uh, stains like the Rapalisia have. So we want to know, is there any connections for that? Uh, uh, I mean, uh, what do you think about that? Thank I you. Thank you. And uh, I think, yeah, your, your work sounds absolutely fascinating. Um, so. I know that in the UK there's a group who is examining the microbiota of aeroids because obviously we don't have access to Rapalisia, so, but we have lots of aeroids and they're easy to grow. We even have Amorphophallus titanum growing in, um, in the UK. So, and, and, we, and I actually have joined that group on the periphery examining the microbiota, but I don't know anything about the, you are the experts <laughs> on the microbiota of, of Rapalisia. I'm interested in your question about color as, as well, because they, they are very variable. Um, so Rafflesia benculuensis is a very pale color, um, and then we've seen, obviously, the much redder colors. And also, the markings, the, the striking white markings that we see in all or many Rafflesia. Um, and then also, I'm interested in the processes, you know, the little spines on the disc, because they we do not know what the function of, of those is. We, we're wondering if they may help direct thermal currents within the flower. And so my, I've asked the mathematicians to, to examine that, but, but we don't know. So, so I think your question generates lots more questions, which is the wonderful thing about science. But, but perhaps we could chat afterwards and, and be in contact, and because it's nice when all of the Rafflesia community come together <laughs> so we I help think, one another. Uh, we need to make uh, collaborations between uh, botanists and also microbiologists, and microbiologists. To, uh, to see about the the evac and also about uh, the yeah the microbial community evac to especially for replacement grad maybe uh, from our faculty MIPA and also from agriculture yeah. and also maybe from the University of Oxford so we can open let's the connect collaborations for yeah that. let's do it great plan Thank you, Mr. Cipriadi. Yeah. Uh, Rizky, sorry, uh, Dr. Rizky. And might be the last question for uh, today's uh, general guest lecture. From, yep. Okay. Uh, okay, thank you for uh, for the opportunity to give me uh, to a question. Uh, the first, uh, I'm sorry for in advance because my English is so bad. And okay, uh, my name is Alpres Rijenos, and I'm 
currently participate in independent uh, student exchange program. Yes. And I'm, I came from West Sulawesi. Uh, and the first, I, I want to inform you that the West Sulawesi is uh, there a flower that uh, the you show us the slide. I mean, the, the one has uh, can eating insect. Depends. Yeah, the pansies. We have we have that uh, in West Sulawesi. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then the second. Lucky you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I want to question. I, I want you to tell me uh, to tell me more about uh, what is the importance the to protecting Rafflesia Rafflesia flower instead of uh, biodiversity because you uh, as you as we know that. Your community, your community uh, have a uh, yeah. You tell me that you there are three uh, functions about your community. Is the uh, the first one is to tell everyone that we have to protecting uh, Rafflesia flower, and I just want to uh, you to know to inform me about another function about Rafflesia flower. <laughs> Thank you. So maybe uh, I will. Uh, the question. So uh, he informed that in West Sulawesi, they are also uh, yes. we can find the pentas uh, as well. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. I'd like to go one day. <laughs> <laughs> so and then, uh, what is the important to protect Rafflesia? Uh, oh, I mean, so in terms of. Uh, people yes, yes. and that's in terms of uh, like uh, the students young generation yes. so yeah, yeah. Uh, what is your uh, I mean okay yeah I, I think um, it, the the next generation is is, is so important because um, plants are interesting in that they connect the, the generations um, and so for example I know that when I was a child, my grandparents knew lots about the local plants and the local names, and maybe it's the same, I think, in other cultures. That, um, and they passed that knowledge down through the generations. Um, and, and I think the same is true, for, I imagine, here for something like Rafflesia, that your parents know about it, your grandparents know about it, and each of us passes down to the next generation um, a care and appreciation and a love for that local plant because it's in a way it's part of who we are it's our culture is connected to the nature around us um, and I think that's that's really important and I was so impressed when I visited um, different parts of Benkulu and met these active groups such as K KPPLS Deki Bang Deki KPPLS KPPL, sorry, KPPL, these these um, community groups who are very passionate about Rafflesia and promote the the importance of it. And one of the things that Pat, Adrian, and I are keen to do is to understand how can we replicate and deploy that approach in other parts of Southeast Asia, um, so that Rafflesia is cared about everywhere. Thank you for your question. Thank you, Dr. Chris. So I think uh, this is the last question. I believe that we still have any more questions or topic to be discussed. However, due to limited time, we need to end up uh, our discussion uh, session. Uh, for the conclusion, I think there are uh, some insights that we can uh, learn. Uh, there are so much needs for Raplesia, fragmentation habitat as well. But we have uh, an opportunity to contribute to protect the Raplesia, uh, like uh, building and maintain the awareness of the Raplesia, 
uh, in Bengkulu or Indonesia we uh, develop local wisdom so like KPPL uh, and then uh, I think uh, create more young volunteer is uh, also as well uh, as good uh, solution to to uh, to build the owners and also to protect the the plant in the woods uh, and then we also need uh, a lot of support from all academician researchers government NGO and as well as uh, fund agency and I think uh, collaboration research and also uh, uh, sharing the knowledge this uh, the key to develop a good uh, foundation for uh, protecting the the plants uh, I think this uh, the conclusion uh, that can I give for this lecture uh, ladies and gentlemen uh, we finally come to the end part of this international guest lecture before I close this session I would like to uh, invite head of forestry department vice dean and mr agus susatya to give certificate of appreciation to the dr chris uh, in front of us please uh, yes. uh, pak edi pak jansen okay. uh, ada tiga ya uh, Oke, okay, uh, Profesor Pat, you as well come here and uh, also Adrian, uh -huh. please come to join us. Yeah. Uh -huh. Thank you very much for all. Okay. Can you sit again? Uh, finally, I would like to thanks very much to Dr. Chris for your interesting presentation and uh, it will be beneficial for all of us here and then I think uh, in the next year or in next next future, we we, we can get, uh, give the others uh, general lecture for uh, for the department and also University of Bengkulu. And please give applause to our speaker today. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good good afternoon, and then uh, wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, sekarang ambil foto ya kita ambil foto ke depan so take a picture here uh, all participant can come to in front and then uh, dr. Chris uh, mr. Pat and Adrians you can join with us here and then pasti pri Pariski <laughs> Ibu Ibu Zahra ya uh. Uh, silakan adik-adik mahasiswa untuk bergabung ke depan ya kita sama-sama ayo Pak Sipri Pak Rizky uh -huh. Bapak Ibu dosen kehutanan uh -huh. silakan gabung Oke okay. uh, boleh gabung berapa lah di sini gitu ya yep. uh -huh. 